Glad there's so many people here today. That's wonderful. Um, I am going to get Lamala's camera set up, but he, we're not ready to start yet, just so you know. So I'm going to get it on and then turn the camera off. So don't don't get your don't get too excited. All right. Good evening. <laughs> All right. I'm ready. The heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra, sutra. Are you Bhagavan? <laughs> I'm going to start over. <laughs> the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra. Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with the great community of monks and the great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavadokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavadokiteshvara How should any son of lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of the human nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, 
not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhisoha, Tayata gate gate paragate. Ayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Valakiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Valakiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the robes of gods, nagas, humans, ashuras, and gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised. That's spoken by the Bhagavan. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think there's one more scene in this comedy of errors, Lama. Oh, uh, OK. <laughs> in accordance with the interests and the faculty of the sentient beings, please turn the wheel of dharma of the small, great, and common vehicles. Thank you. Good, I will. <laughs> so today's talk a little going to be a little technical. Um, so uh, I know we have some scholars here, so you shouldn't have any trouble following or even correcting me, I hope, right? So we just uh, recited Heart Sutra from the Prajnaparamita Sutras, which are considered by Tibetans to be the second turning of the wheel. Uh, but tonight's um, and the ongoing uh, Shastra, which we're reading is considered the third turning of the wheel. I think in India, um, they were most concerned with, uh, not as much with doctrine, but with behavior. So in India, a lot of the discussions are around 
we're around the Vinaya, what's uh, permissible to do. So a lot of the arguments weren't about like what people were thinking, but actually how they were acting. But in Tibet, um, they became very interested in uh, philosophical uh, and uh, meditational controversies. And one way they started thinking about um, the texts they receive and the teachings they receive from India was to classify them starting around the 14th century uh, by a term called, uh, terms called Rantong and Shentong. Rantongs, uh, you didn't find these classifications in India. They were maybe uh, alluded to, but uh, it was a Shakya teacher who studied more Nyingma doctrines that eventually uh, came up with the terms. Rantong means um, empty of self nature, and Shentong means uh, basically empty of other nature. And the uh, commentary that we're reading, the two commentaries actually on the Buddha nature, the Uttara Tantra Shastra by Jamgan Kuntral and then by uh, Kempo Sotrim, uh, look at the text from a Shentong point of view. Now, I haven't brought it up earlier because I wanted people to get the basic spirit of the text, which celebrates and exhorts us uh, to keep uncovering and looking for and seeing that the Buddha qualities are right here, right now, and just need to be recognized and developed. And that we can say many positive things and must say positive things about uh, the nature of ultimate reality, which is quite unlike the way we started out. I asked people to start out reading uh, Nargajuna's uh, and Chandukirti, and then uh, going on to tenants, right? So uh, right away, uh, I kind of slammed people uh, with uh, kind of the second turning of the wheel doctrine. I could have started with a very difficult uh, start, which would be starting people with Abhidharma. So even though the Abhidharma texts uh, were written by Mahayana people, basically like Vasubandhu and Asanga, um, they talk about dharmas and they talk about specific things and specific uh, experiences that seem real and definable, exactly the kind of real and definable experiences and objects of knowledge and minds that are uh, refuted as being empty in the Heart Sutra, right? But uh, we will get to Abhidharma, but my experience with Westerners is uh, once you enter the thicket of Abhidharma, you, you never leave. <laughs> and I want to make sure, uh, in this Sangha anyway, that people have uh, uh, still uh, going for uh, Tantra uh, and specifically Mahamudra and Dzogchen. So, <clears throat> but uh, for those um, brave souls, we, we will look at Abhidharma texts um, <clears throat> And uh, you have something to look forward to with that. But I'm most interested today in looking at wh why why the Rantong, Shantong, Shantong became uh, such an interesting part of uh, Tibetan discussion. Basically, with Madhyamaka and with Songkhapa, uh, uh, the Madhyamakas and Madhyamikas uh, are interested in absolutely saying no more than is necessary. So uh, we're just going to say uh, all things are dependently originated. And particularly with the Prasangika Madhyamika, we're going to say that uh, all uh, things are actually imputed. <clears throat> it comes close almost to a nihilistic stance, doesn't it? And I know some of the students here were actually very close to saying everything is empty or nothing exists. But uh, we came to the rescue with a third turning of the wheel of Dharma saying, no, uh, Buddha nature exists and uh, these qualities exist. What is the difference between uh, these two views of uh, Rantong and Shentong is uh, how do things exist and how do we talk about ultimate reality? 
the uh, style of uh, Prasankika, Madhyamika, uh, of Nagarjuna, and particularly as interpreted by Lama Tsongkhapa, is basically, uh, we're not gonna say much about ultimate reality, except uh, it's empty or it's shunya. Uh, we're going to point out the fact that all we have to do is uh, deconstruct the reification of reality and notice that things uh, just exist relatively and that's it. So in a way that style is very much um, along the style of uh, you don't have any problems. <laughs> if someone says to us, however, like, um, actually, you, you don't have a problem. There's nothing wrong with you. And we're struggling with a problem. We, we usually feel kind of, um, well, that's great, but actually I do, right? But, uh, and Mahdi Makan saying, well, actually you don't have any problems. Uh, they're made up. And uh, we don't have to say anything else than just let go of your delusional uh, situation and then you'll be free. So uh, Mahdi Makans don't say an awful lot about things uh, other than to deconstruct uh, the reification and the imputation and to recognize that all things are dependently originated, including emptiness. So it's actually quite simple. We just say, well, um, just recognize uh, this and then go about your day. So uh, we do recognize in Prasanka Madhimika that things uh, are, do exist conventionally. We do want you to drive on the right or left side of the road, depending upon the country you're in. And we do want you to uh, go along with the conventions, but uh, we're not saying a lot more. This philosophy is really interesting because uh, it works very well when people are able to just say, great, I, I don't have, I can just wake up and I don't have a problem. Yeah. So, uh, my teacher, uh, Geshe Gatso, was um, very uh, strongly into just ordinary reality. Like, why are you making things into a problem? Why do you have to know all this, what's behind everything? Why can't you just uh, enjoy having a nice cup of coffee, a nice cup of tea? Look at the blue sky, it's beautiful. Look at the trees, they're beautiful. Why? Why do you have to like, uh, make a big deal out of everything. So in an interesting way, the uh, Prasangika Madhyamikan style is uh, somewhat kind of Zen, you know, just like, uh, just um, enjoy your life, don't make a mess of things, and the things work. But what more do you need to say? We don't have to say a lot about an underlying reality or, or the positive things. We don't have to build a lily. We just have to... Uh, realize we're free, not make things worse or create more suffering through delusions and the rest take care of itself. So from a practice point of view, uh, the Prasangika Madhyamikan style, uh, where we don't assert anything above showing that delusion is wrong or ridiculous, um, can be a very freeing way to live life. But if we approach it just philosophically, then it does um, seem kind of nihilistic because people do like to hear like, well, um, you said there's really nothing wrong and I just need to let go of my fixations, but um, what then? Do I just kind of fall into this vast pit of emptiness? Well, no, you just have a cup of tea and you go out to the movies and you meditate and you help others. It's all just completely obvious. But uh, in general, people need a little bit more than just let go and enjoy your life and be kind to others. So uh, we have uh, a movement that would start in India uh, to say all the positive things and to assert that there are plenty of positive things to say about the nature of reality and the nature of enlightenment. And those were received in particular from uh, Maitreya, the future Buddha Maitreya in visionary form and uh, given to a Sangha in visionary form. So <clears throat> the debate in Tibet became like, well, as a third turning of the wheel and the doctrine of Buddha nature, are, are we really saying something about the ultimate or are we still talking about relative truth? 
So are we still talking about relative truth when we say Buddha nature is permanent, Buddha nature is blissful, Buddha nature is ongoing, Buddha nature is spontaneous, Buddha nature is full of all the paramitas and the, uh, all the boomies and all the good things. Are we still talking about relative truth or uh, are we actually saying things that exist on an ultimate level? Well, the, the Shentong approach, approach does say, yeah, we're, we're talking about things on an ultimate level. And um, if you take too rigid a uh, Madhyamikan approach, uh, you're, you're missing out and you're in danger of going into nothing matters, nothing exists kind of state. Of course, from the Rontung point of view, uh, when we put absolutes uh, on uh, the Buddha nature or call absolutes on emptiness, then we're straying over into making things into an Atman, making things into a self with a capital S, uh, getting stuck again on constructed aspects, getting stuck again on uh, thinking there's something behind the experience that's mysterious and missing, and basically becoming Advaita Vedantas. <clears throat> so really, uh, since the beginning of Dharma coming to Tibet, there, there has been these kind of debates overall. Uh, for the most part, the Gaelic school has been very strong with uh, the Rantong approach. And overall, the Kargyu Nyingma style has been very much Shentong. But um, in the 19th century uh, in Tibet, there began, began a, a movement uh, called Rime or uh, non-biased. Sometimes it's called non-sectarian, but actually like non-biased, a little more literal. And uh, Jamgun Kamchul was one of the main uh, proponents of, of this. So uh, he uh, tried to study and collect texts and uh, see the value in all the different lineages and traditions. And um, basically it's because of his work and others, um, the Kenseis, uh, uh, that you know, we still have some text left from these traditions that uh, weren't lost or destroyed during the um, invasion by the Chinese. One of the uh, people that um, I'll be quoting in the future and working with uh, is uh, Jumipam Rinpoche, uh, very uh, erudite uh, and strong meditator that um, from the Nyingma school that uh, actually uh, criticized um, both the Shantong and Rantong positions in a very creative way and um, tried to put uh, the primacy of experience uh, uh, central to his doctrine without ignoring uh, logic and analysis and the traditional disciplines of, uh, and logicians like Dignaga and Dharmakirti. So, um, for, for some very special people, we, we'll be looking at um, his famous text uh, called Beacon of Certainty um, with a uh, able uh, uh, commentary and translation by uh, Mr. Pettit, who was a student of Dindra Kensei Rinpoche's. So, <clears throat> but uh, Nipa Rinpoche, who I think lived in uh, for a few years into the 20th century, um, as in alone, the uh, Rime teachers, uh, the ones that are interested in uh, combining and, and looking at uh, both uh, Rantong and Shantong equally, uh, were the, like the 16th uh, Karmapa, uh, who some of us met, and of course 17th Karmapa, some of us met, Dujum Rinpoche, um, Tonga Rinpoche, uh, Tonga Rinpoche, his uh, book on Shantong and uh, I suggest, and of course, uh, the Dalai Lama. So uh, from time to time, I've suggested that uh, people consult the article uh, contained in the book, uh, Kindness, Clarity, and Insight. Uh, it's called the Union of the Old and New Translation Schools, uh, which is quite a, a feat to put that all together in a short talk, a short article. So, <clears throat> uh, Thank you for some of this technical listening. Uh, 
But uh, to make it very simple, like uh, <clears throat> it's important to uh, struggle and investigate uh, how we really see things uh, from my point of view and not just say, well, I just want the right answer. That, that becomes too easy, uh, particularly if you uh, decide on right answers based on schools or lineages or, or political interests. So uh, that's why I'm having people read things originally. So we get to know like, what can we really say uh, about uh, reality with a capital R? What can we say about delusion? How does it arise? Uh, how can we inspire ourselves? And uh, how do we get lost? A big part uh, that uh, President Dalai Lama, Mipa Ramache, and uh, Dijin Ramache, Dingo Kensei Ramache, and my own teacher advocated was a strong union of study and meditation practice. I've never met any uh, lamas uh, that are uh, authentic, that, that haven't also been scholars and uh, been readers, and also at the same time, great retreatants and meditators. So there is something where we can refine our intellect. It does make a difference what we say. Uh, it does make a difference how we uh, have an outlook. Uh, and it does uh, make a difference to others also. So <clears throat> I wanted to introduce these terms because uh, so much going forward is about how do we look at uh, these uh, different approaches to Dharma and how can or should we integrate them? Because there's more than just this Rantong Shentong, there's like different approaches in foundation, foundation Buddhism, where it just talks about, of course, everything being real is real suffering, real Nirvana, real uh, thoughts, real mind, real Dharmas. And then the second turn in the wheel, the Prajna Paramita, where the emphasis is alone on the perfection of wisdom. So we have to look at sutra and tantra also, like the sutras uh, usually talk about foundational Buddhism and Mahayana, uh, but don't get into quite the uh, subjects that tantra gets into. And then when we look at Mahamudra and Dzogchen, it also has its own uh, particular approach. It can seem overwhelming at times, uh, unless it's set out in an organized way. And then the richness of the of Ajahn or Tibetan tradition becomes evident. But overall, I'd like to people to always be thinking like, in what way is my uh, life, my training and practice experiential? And what way, in what way is it conceptual and intellectual? All of the schools, eventually say we must have complete non-conceptual realization. So uh, even though they may differ about what can be said about reality, what's absolute uh, and what's empty, uh, all the schools say we must have direct, non-conceptual, immediate knowledge. We can't have subject-object knowledge where we're merely watchers or just merely um, uh, gathering information about reality. We must have an experiential uh, awakening ourselves. Uh, no one can do it for us. And reality both has to be uh, discovered and investigated and grown and perhaps ultimately let go in a certain way. So I'd like to uh, pause here for a second and uh, see if I'm moving uh, like too fast or uh, not fast enough for some people. And we have Kristen on the floor. Uh, Connor's here and was asking why I read two commentaries from the same perspective. Um, well, and the simple answer is they're both in the same book. <laughs> and the other simple answer is I like them. <laughs> uh, 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 
commentary by John Gun Control um, uh, every once in a while has like you'll find in the book uh, it'll say C annotation number blah blah and uh, this is where students um, uh, of Campus Ultrams, I think it was in Europe, you know, asked some questions about certain things. So uh, in a sense, the commentaries are, are one because uh, Campus Sultrim is elucidating uh, the commentary by John Gun Control. So um, I wish we could read, uh, you know, other commentaries um, from different positions. Um, uh, and there may be them. The other commentary uh, that I'm aware of uh, by uh, Lama Hukum from uh, in England or Wales uh, called um, The Buddha Within was one of the original um, Western commentaries on the text. Uh, she's, uh, well, she's older than me now, so she's elderly. Um, she, she also was a student of uh, Campus Salt Dreams and uh, has a, uh, a uh, nice online program still. I think she's in semi-retreat, a little bit semi-retirement like that. Um, but there's, there's always extra reading for people that want to um, hear the commentary from another side. And uh, there probably are translated commentary uh, by some Kappa on, on the text too, like that. Mama, it's Ellen. I had a question. Yes. On uh, Rong Tong and Shen Tong, I looked it right. up just primarily to get the spelling, but then my mind started wandering. I was reading Wikipedia, which is pretty dangerous. But anyway, uh, it's a, it says for Shen Tong that they, the belief is that abs, absolute reality is itself not empty. I don't know if you could say a little bit more about the distinction or respond to that that seems that seems sort of counter to what you've taught us well uh we started out on on looking from one point of view very strict madimakan point of view and then tenants and so now we're coming at it from another point of view uh, this is traditional uh, monastic style education we lead you down the garden path and then do a 180 uh, sometimes the Shentongs talked about like it's uh, reality is empty of everything that it isn't. So it's empty of duality and, and empty of all the conflicting emotions and empty of fixation. But uh, it's full of the qualities uh, of Buddha nature. So permanence and awakening and luminous mind, of course like that. So uh, obviously emptiness is being used in a slightly different way here, right? So sometimes emptiness is used in a way of negating uh, the essence of something um, without negating the qualities. So sometimes it says it's not empty, meaning it has qualities. So a little bit more tougher thing is to investigate like uh, what do we really say when something doesn't have its own essence? This is quite deep, you see. So when we say empty as coming about through cause and conditions or empty because things exist relatively, uh, still in the back of that, uh, we're saying things are empty because they don't have their own essence. So this is like another discussion like in two Mondays, but uh, uh, we have to find out, like, what did the Buddha say or what did these great uh, teachers and what did they continue to say when things are empty from their own side or having their own essence? So uh, we're not always negating, we're not negating things have appearance, but uh, sometimes we're negating what's called essence. So one way to uh, that some teachers uh, have uh, sometimes resolve this says yes uh the, the buddha nature uh has these qualities uh it's empty in the sense of having uh an essence that we can find uh 
but it's not empty of the powers and the function of that Buddha nature. So uh, we could say that's splitting hairs, but uh, what's core to the Buddhist path is um, when we go looking for something specifically, uh, we may not, we will find that it isn't, doesn't exist the way it first appears. So uh, a big way of looking at these discussions is um, how do things appear to an ordinary person, man on the street, as Gilbert Ryle, the British philosopher, would say. I had to throw that in, got a bachelor's in philosophy, sorry. So, and but how does it appeal and appear? How does reality appear to a Buddha or with yogic insight? From uh, the main part of the tradition, uh, almost all the schools say that a Buddha sees both uh, conventional reality and ultimate reality at the same time. So if you become Buddhas, which you all should, if you study and practice diligently, then you won't have a problem because you will see uh, both conventional or relative and absolute world, however you define that, at the same time. In other words, you'll be omniscient. Sounds like a good plan, right? But it's strange, yeah. So I think emptiness um, is not is a fluid, you know, is it, and particularly in India and particularly in Tibet, um, there isn't one, you know, kind of uh, yardstick that's easy to measure, right? So. I think when the French created the meter, uh, they actually for a long time had uh, this metal bar suspended in um, some uh, tube that didn't have any oxygen, right? So they said there is an existent meter somewhere, right? Uh, I think that was abandoned a number of years ago, maybe not too long ago. So now it has to do with uh, certain vibrations of a certain uh, maybe helium or something like that, right? So uh, the idea of emptiness itself and what it negates or what it affirms, of course, is, is a major discussion right there. So I think uh, uh, you know, next time I talk, I, I may bring in uh, some of the uh, arguments or discussions that um, Mipam Rimshe particularly brings to the fore and that uh, the Dalai Lama has also brought forth. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. Okay. Karen? You're on mute, Karen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I have a really dumb question. <laughs> Oh, no. You're talking very intelligently, but I have a really dumb question okay. um, that occurred to me when you were talking. <laughs> and, and that when you're, when you're looking at the emptiness of other, that can be other meaning another sentient being, or that can mean other like a table or something like that, right? But, but so we can say that the table is, is essenceless, uh, you know, does not exist from its own side, which makes sense. But I mean, don't isn't it? It doesn't have Buddha nature. So I mean, don't we don't we look at things differently depending on whether they're a sentient being or whether they're a immaterial object? Yes, that's a really good question. Absolutely good question. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Uh, Many times when uh, one presentation of emptiness, of course, it's easiest to talk about objects, right? Um, you know, because it's easy to say, okay, like uh, a chariot uh, chair can be broken into its parts, and then we can't say it exists as a chair anymore. And even we can take the body and parts of the mind to uh, break it up analytically like that. But when we're focusing on experience, particularly when we're focusing on 
uh, developing wisdom, then it's a little trickier. Because uh, then we're talking in, in a way a little bit about the subjective sense. So it's fairly easy to talk about reality out there, um, whether it's people or objects, but uh, it doesn't make any difference if the, our attention, our mind as confused, right? So uh, even when we're feeling ill, like it was a couple a day ago, you know, it's like my uh, intellect didn't change about reality, but things felt different, right? So from the third turning of the wheel um, and from the yogic point of view, uh, if we don't have a, a clear awareness, um, what we believe about things out there or even what we believe are about the operations of our mind won't make any difference. So it's absolutely essential to uh, develop a, a wisdom mind, a non-dual wisdom mind, uh, sometimes called uh, you know, Rigpa, sometimes called uh, Yeshe, because uh, it's actually the knowing mind, uh, ultimately, that is the most important. So uh, we can establish the, the ethics and we can establish uh, that, that we need to drive on the right-hand side of the road. And, but if you're not paying attention or you're drunk, it doesn't, you know, the rules or, or what reality is doesn't make much difference, right? So uh, in Tantra and particularly in Mahamudra and Dzogchen, we have to actually uh, develop the wisdom mind we actually have to develop a non-dual wisdom um, because without the clear seeing, without the luminous clarity and the spaciousness of the mind, the ability to consider all objects, the ability to be open, uh, as well as the, the energy of the mind, um, we can have all sorts of uh, ideas about reality and about what should be done, but it wouldn't make any difference. So. Am I taking a, a Shentong or a Rantong point of view? <laughs> uh, the Rimei teachers that uh, I've studied with, including my own teacher and Dalai Lama, um, would say that, yes, we, we need to have a correct view of outside reality to teach and get along with others, but we must have uh, the awareness. We must have the realization that comes through yogic practice. Don't we all want to just feel alive? Uh, we, we, if we have the correct view of reality intellectually, or even if we behave ourselves, but we feel dead inside, we feel lost, we feel conflicted, it's still, the work hasn't been done, right? What do you think? So who's next? Yeah, okay. Hi. Wherever you are. <laughs> Yeah. There he is. Hi, Lamala. Thank you for this. Hi. Team. Okay. Uh, something that uh, has been a struggle for me in, in this is um, the idea of these these qualities that are absolute, but that if a being takes on these qualities, these absolute qualities, it's still conventional reality. So, like. In my daily practice, I talk about, you know, being empty of self, but also that the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas are also empty of inherent existence, too. I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about how it is that we have this interdependent origination, we, we take on or beings take on these qualities and, and they seem like, you know, just absolutely otherworldly what they can do, how they can see, how they can travel, but yet they're still not of absolute nature at that point in time that, you know, the absolute nature yeah. is just the qualities of the Buddha, I guess. I, I, I struggle with that concept. Uh, uh, understandably. Uh, what's important um, and difficult is that all the Buddhist teachings about nature, mind, uh, nature of, problems and reality and mountains and rivers and everything uh, are trying to uh, 
present that without a reference to a personal self. Even conventionally. So most of the time, like in psychology, we're still saying my thoughts, my feelings, uh, you know, I need to be better. Everything is referred back to a personal self. But what if you tried to construct uh, a transformational uh, system, liberation system, without reference to a personal or an absolute self? It's a little bit scientific, a little bit like science, right? When you're doing physics, you're not in chemistry. We're not talking about, you know, the person, right? So what's really interesting is that um, even though we talk about uh, Buddhists and sentient beings, uh, none of the teachings actually are owned by a person. It feels like a person is doing it. I feel like a person. I'm talking, you know, I'm sitting here. And you feel like a person. But all the descriptions uh, are from the standpoint of well, we don't see any persons here or uh, separate Buddhas. So we can't take on Buddha qualities any more than you could take on gravity or space. And that's the hard part is that, um, particularly in the West, uh, the language is very much personal based. Um, and not that other languages don't have their own uh, problems. Um, but uh, I'd like to relate, uh, as I have a few times, you know, my experience when I was living at the monastery at Sarajay, uh, it was uniquely unpsychological. Usually when we're talking about persons, we're, we're talking about evaluations like, um, how did you like your meditation today? That that wouldn't come up for Tibetans generally. <laughs> it's like saying, "How do you like gravity?" So uh, very very few things are personalized in Buddhism, um, even though proper names are used. And that's one reason why Mahayana um, we have these celestial bodhisattvas, particularly Manjushri and and uh, uh, the major teachings, uh, particularly with Dzogchen and Nipam, um, not a person. You're not going to, um, Manjushri doesn't have like, you know, <laughs> doesn't have an address. So, uh, that we can't take them on. Maybe before Isaac Newton, nobody really thought about gravity or Galileo or something like that. They obviously knew that things fell, but, uh, they weren't aware that there was gravity and then, then we started seeing, okay, this is this is gravity, and there's non-gravity in space. So uh, realization is something like that. Something was there and operating, but you didn't see it as such, and now you see it as such. But you you can neither own it nor give it away. So in Dzogchen we say we say you need you can either acquire it nor give it away. Um, you know, Mipam would say, it's so close, you can't see it. It's so obvious that it seems laughable. So we just move past it like that. <clears throat> Someone's got one more question, I know. Hi. Is that me now? <laughs> that is you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, what you were just talking about, I think the uh, uh, the longer Prajnaparamita sutras make more clear than the Heart Sutra does. Like when you look <clears throat> at the 8,000 line sutra, the 25,000 line sutra, the, the, you know, the, the Bodhisattva is always there saying, what Bodhisattva are you talking to? Who is it that I can point to? That when when you talk about a bodhisattva, I find them. But anyway, that's not my my question. But just, <laughs> good point, though. Yeah. And the, and when then what what you were talking about also the it's the like the 
Freudian thing. The, the guy's in a wheelchair and they've determined that there's nothing wrong with him physically. And now you understand, right? Now you understand that this is all just in your mind. So you fully understand. Yes, doctor, I fully understand. Okay, so get up and walk. I can't. <laughs> That's what it always reminds me of. But I do have a question in the midst of all this garbage. That I'm... <laughs> you you kind of laid out this uh, the uh, the distinction between how a reality is perceived by a Buddha and how a reality is perceived by a sentient being. Uh, right. Is there also another? distinction between the meditative state and the post meditative state how the what's being described how it's being arrived at and what the thought processes are um yes definitely particularly with john gun control of course in his commentary um where uh the big emphasis um in his commentary on uh tartantra shastra uh the meditative state is uh very much non-conceptual non-analytical uh and when we the post meditation state is is where we're we're noticing uh others and differentiation and so forth and that's kind of where we're doing our um vipassion is out kind of in the world like that so uh there 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 is a difference, and then, of course, the idea is to uh, uh, to blend them together and to co-emerge in awareness. But uh, uh, there's a big difference there. So he he's really pushing hard for direct yogic perception and meditation, and uh, a strong uh, start in shamatha, of course. <clears throat> but uh, uh, it's it's possible, I think, to do both. I think, I think it's possible to uh, do analytic, kind of logical investigation, you know, the nature of self, like, is it in my, is it in my brain? Is it in my foot? Is it, you know, where is it? Uh, in a meditative way, too. Uh, like reading is a med can be a meditative expression of Vipassana. So, um, uh, in any case, the, uh, most of the time we're going to have uh, a disconnect between uh, our formal training and our practice. The practice is spontaneous. Uh, daily life, you don't, you don't. Uh, it's not supposed to be perfect, and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Whereas in training on the cushion, you're trying to create a perfect kind of lab environment like that. So uh, the Tibetan system, and in fact, the tantric system is based on building up uh, a sense of contrast so that there's uh, a spark. So the tantric system is uh, uh, built on um, laying out um, uh, these uh, dualities, so to speak, so that we can see them at the same time. Whereas other systems like Advaita Vedanta or the, um, you know, other systems based on just oneness, just say like, we, we don't lay anything out, just forget it and be absolute like that. But uh, the tantric system, and I, I think all of Buddhist system is very interested in um, having you see uh, uh, delusion and realization simultaneously. And, uh, so much of the practice and the training is, is based on um, trying to put, uh, you know, kind of like a Picasso painting, you know, you want to see both sides of the face at the same time. And uh, that's why the, um, the training is frustrating um, for the most part for Westerners, because we just want to, like, I just want, you know, to tell me, should I turn right or left? <laughs> and just tell me exactly how to get there in a linear way. Um, and uh, the teachings actually, even though they kind of presented in a linear step-by-step -step practice, um, they are not at all linear in that sense. So, uh, you know, I see it as we're totally giving up a dominator sense of 
reality where uh, there's a mono reality and that's it, which I see as a form of fascism. So uh, that's why particularly in the Buddha Dharma study program, uh, I, want, I don't want Buddhist fascists. I want people to see that, wow, there can be a whole bunch of different uh, viewpoints and um, you know, maybe uh, the alive uh, happens in the middle like that. So we are in Tantra and Mahamudra, particularly in Dzogchen, look, we want to look at um, uh, the differences and, and uh, see how they uh, complement each other. And uh, the wisdom mind, uh, this open nature of awareness, the luminous nature uh, arises in the middle. It's very weird, but it's difficult because we usually just like, just tell me the right answer. Just get rid of people and delusions we don't like, um, and, and then I'll be fine. But of course, as we know in Dzogchen, uh, we're, we're, we're very much interested in seeing uh, delusions uh, arising from uh, the Alia Jhana, right? From the uh, purified Alia. We, we're, we're just so delighted when this, uh, you know, things manifesting uh, with delusions and realizations will appear together. Yeah. We usually want to just get rid of things, right? That's the standard approach in psychology and in Dharma. Like, I just want to get rid of my anger. I just want to get rid of this person. I just want to kick this person out of the temple. I just want to stop reading those books. This person would go away or die or just get rid of my delusion and um, all will be fine. Um, but I just want to get to a place where everything's okay. That's right, like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, in the higher teachings, uh, Tantra, which involves Mahamudra and Dzogchen, we're, we're actually interested in you. Uh, you know, please just hold your seat and um, uh, embrace both the light and dark. Yeah. We only have a few minutes left. Good questions, everybody. One last complaint or question before we close. Hi, Jules. Hi, Lama. Hi. Um, so my question kind of um, bounces off of your answer to James's question, and um, I've heard this so many times from you in every everywhere, pretty much. But you said that Tibetans are uniquely unpsychological, and there are very few things that are personalized in Buddhism when they practice. But then why why do we come to Darshan and tell you about our practice, our training? And I personally spend so much time after Shamatha contemplating, you know, how many times did I lose focus, the quality of my practice, things like that. Is that wrong necessarily? I'm not sure why, but it just hearing your answer today just hit some kind of disconnect. So I'm just wondering if I can get more clarity. Um reporting on our training, our experiences, the obstacles, and how we deal with the obstacles is essential and actually isn't personal. Okay. Uh, then uh, daily life, of course, we're going to have a conventional person. Mm -hmm. So we have to say, I'm going to the store or uh, I'm not happy. And then the, the two... Uh, worlds uh, become integrated. But the way to integrate them is is actually to first differentiate them, differentiate them uh, and not just squash one or the other side. So spending time with yourself and being reflective on your training isn't it's psychological per se. So I'm just kind of misunderstanding things. Uh, being uh, having an inner world is when I say psychological, I'm uh, just using a specific way that er, you know uh, everything would come back to the me. Mm -hmm. So coming back to what Freud would call the ego, right? The okay. uh, center part of ordinary consciousness. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely um, to do the style of study that I've been trained in, uh, 
we have to do you know the reading and and struggle with it we must do the the yogic meditations and we must report to someone uh and then finally we we must have a uh a close sangha of people that are doing similar things so we can uh, refine it. And then we have to have a, a, a global community. And uh, because it only works when you have that whole structure going. Mm -hmm. Whereas when people take bits and pieces, they just say, well, I just like reading, but I don't like meditating. <laughs> or just like the group, the sangha, but I don't like sitting. Or I just want to save the world, but I don't want to meditate, you know, like. Uh, yeah. When it's compartmentalized that, then it's a problem. But we have so it's seeing everything yeah. cohesively. Yeah, but uh, usually um, we're unable at first to distinguish our personal narrative, uh, you know, beyond. Uh, you know, we can't we can't go beyond that in a uh, psychological or mental way. Uh, where we can do it medically, we could say, "Well, my blood pressure is so and so." Right? You you wouldn't you wouldn't just general like say the blood pressure is me, right? <laughs> right? I mean, or I mean, that's me. I have a blood pressure of one eighty or hundred. That's not right. But we yeah. usually identify thoughts and feelings and and everything else is a me. So the Dharma is going to look things a little bit like medically. Like uh, it's going to be our um, inner anatomy, like that. Mm -hmm. the thing is, the, the inner anatomy uh, doesn't ultimately refer back to a controlling entity called the self. That's that's the funny part. Like, who's running the show and who's doing all this? How do we initiate behaviors? How do we take responsibility for them? How do we, um, you know, grow and develop? These, these are questions that are tricky actually to answer in the Buddhist context because it's so easy just to label everything and, and, and kind of toss in this big box called the me, the I, right? Yeah. Like, well, I'm doing it or I'm talking, you know? So when I'm in Darshan, I ask people, well, they're talking about their experience um, and maybe deep experiences, particularly uh, in even shamatha samadhi. And they say, well, I'm having the experience and then I said, well, who are you? And they just go, me. There's no realization there, right? Yeah. You, just had, you just had an experience that then totally got wrapped around uh, the personal self. So it is very strange to talk about one's experience a little bit kind of medically, like you're just talking about uh, your chemistry or your blood pressure or, uh, you know, your digestion, kind of the way physicians and nurses might see it. Yeah, so it's kind of more approaching the cushion a little bit more mechanically, but then taking the time to reflect afterwards. Yeah, we, we always want to reflect, and yeah. that, that's kind of interesting. So we, we, we need to reflect uh, sometimes during the time in the cushion in a special way and also reflect uh, post-meditation experience. So very famously in the seven point mind training, one of the, um, you know, uh, strong slogans is uh, in post-meditation experience, uh, see it as dreamlike, or I prefer Trungpa Rinpoche's translation, and post-meditation experience be a child of illusion. If you just meditate as strong as you do, and you go back uncritically accepting your daily life, uh, nothing will actually mature. It's like you'd have the seed, but you don't have the earth or the water. Like that. So uh, if something doesn't change in your life, you think, well, I, I'll just realize nature, mind, and have the same kind of life. I, I don't think that's possible. Something's something's going to change. So Thank we're you, over a little bit, yeah, just long talk. So, you know, we, we need to close up here. Uh, I'd like to appreciate um, that uh, some of us have gotten the vaccine. Uh, I got my second dose this weekend and a little bit under the weather, but feeling better tonight. So I really appreciate um, that uh, people are working hard to take care of themselves 
so that we can be safe when we're back in the temple full time like that. So let's do a closing uh, and then see you around. Okay. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi, Tens and Jatsa, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions for the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manju Shri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangarakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Uh, I, just, uh, I was thinking uh, about uh, the psychological world, the personal world. So, um, you know, 30 years ago, whenever I'd ask my teacher, like, how am I doing? <laughs> and he, when, when he didn't answer, uh, or sometimes when he would, he'd say, that's a ridiculous question. Because how are you doing? Like, well, uh, it would be like, what would be the correct way to meditate? What would be the correct way to do this bodhisattva activity? There's no reference like, how am I doing? Right? How am I doing? It doesn't make doesn't make sense like that. But in the West, I have to tell people, oh, keep going, you're doing good, right? Uh, uh, my teacher never said I was doing good. Seriously, never. Until one day, uh, when I was seeing him as he was dying in Carmel, he just said, "You're the Lama now. Take over." He never said, I did good at all. So I'm sorry if I compliment some of you because I'm betraying my teacher like that. So don't look, you know, you sh and you shouldn't look for like, how am I doing good? Am I doing good? You know, it's like, you're not even doing bad. So don't ask if you're doing good, right? <laughs> are you are you driving on the right-hand side of the road? <laughs> then ask if you're driving on the right-hand side of the road. Don't ask, how am I doing? So that's kind of the psychological world. But I know it's, we just, we want to know anyway. So my teacher would indulge me finally at the end and say, okay, please, please teach now. That was it. Okay. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Nama. Thank you. Thank you, Lama.